In this video, we're going to go over day two of anti-differentiation. So in day two, I'm going to highlight some things that are important for us to remember because we've just started doing anti-differentiation. So now that we have kind of a general idea about it, I want to highlight a couple of things. So I have things to remember. So anti-differentiation, perhaps I should use a different color. So anti-differentiation um, is also called integration. All right, so if it's called integration, recognize that you are just doing the same thing that we've done when we called it anti-differentiation. All right, so that is important to know. The next number, anti-differentiation of an indefinite integral. So we are currently doing indefinite integral. Indefinite integral means that your symbol for integration looks like this. If it's indefinite, you don't have any numbers here or here. You've never seen numbers put in, so everything we've done thus far has been indefinite. And when you take an anti-differentiation of an indefinite definite integral, remember, remember, remember to always add the constant of integration. Okay, step three. Anti-differentiation of a definite integral will give us a number. Okay, so it says here in the notes that we have only done this part with technology. Um, this year we have not done any technology with it because of all the snow we have had. So know that if you have a definite integral to differentiate, it will look something like this. You'll have that same curly Q, but now perhaps you will have numbers on either end of it. Point to know going forward when you take that antiderivative, you should anticipate having a number as an answer, not an expression with a plus C. That's something to look forward to. Next thing, things to remember number four. Be on the lookout for the integration of 1 over x. Remember that if you try to integrate 1 over x using your rules, what do we get? Well, if 1 Let's first do it like this. So I brought up the 1 over x, so I can use my power rules. If I try to take that anti-differentiation, let me get rid of some of this stuff, what's going to happen is this. I'm looking at that, and I'm saying, well, let's follow the rules. Following the rules gets me x over negative 1 plus 1, divided by negative 1 plus 1 plus the constant of integration. Okay, let's do some of this math. Negative 1 plus 1 is 0. That's okay in the numerator because that just makes x to the 0 is 1. The problem happens in the denominator. You cannot divide by 0. That's undefined. So if you find that when you take an antiderivative, you get an undefined answer. That is your tip-off that you should have done natural log. Go back and do it as a natural log. Uh, the last thing to remember is don't forget that constant of integration. That's going to be important for our work thus far. Okay, right now you should try to do this warm-up. and um, So turn off the video, do the warm-up, and then come back and check and see if you have it correct. Okay, let's do the first one. So if I follow my rules, I see that seven, uh, t to the 7 halves, if I add 1, add it as 2 over 2, that gives me t to the 9 halves divided by 9 halves plus c. Now you would never leave it looking like that because that looks awful. So what would you do when you adjust it? So that would equal t still to the 9 halves. You're not going to do anything with that. Don't change it to 4.5. There's no real need to do that. And then... Now, take your 9 halves and flip it, because when you divide, you multiply by the inverse, and that looks much better. So that is your best answer right there. Okay, I'm going to stop again, and then I'll do the next one. All right, so here's what I have thus far. Look at the first term. That's going to be x to the fourth, because I've added 1 to 3. And then I was dividing by 3 to begin with. Now I'm going to also divide by 4. You can combine the 4 and the 3 to make it 12. That's your first term. Next term, bring up your x to the third, make, make it x to the negative third. 
add 1 to it, that's negative 2, divide by that same negative 2. Then the last term, that is your natural log. So your answer is 3 natural log of x, and then you're going to add just one constant of integration. So you can also clean this up a little bit. So let's see if we can do that. What can we do in terms of cleanup? Well, I'm looking at this second term. So this second term, I'm thinking that you can move the x, move this x down to the denominator. It's going to be next to the negative 2 as an x squared. Instead of having a positive of a negative, which you have here, positive of a negative, make the operation between negative, and that will be cleaned up well enough. So that's all I have to say about the warm-up. Let's use the next slide to go to the next step on this page. Okay, I'm going to stay in the same slide. I just slid this up a little bit so we can see it. Okay, look at this next problem. It says, once you have completed the two warm-up problems, try the following. So, I have given you, in this problem, you have an antiderivative here. They ask you to take the antiderivative, and they take it, and that's their answer. But look, they have a k in their answer. They want you to figure out what the k should be. So what you need to do is go ahead and take the antiderivative. Now, this is the chain rule, which we have not yet done. So let's think about this, remembering that we are always working backwards when we're taking derivatives of a function. So, looking at just the first part, I'm going to take the antiderivative myself, and I get the following. I see I have a power rule initially. So I'm going to write what's in the parentheses, and then I'm going to add 1 to the power, which is going to be making that 4, and then I divide by the 4. All right, I and the prize, look at what they have on the right-hand side. Oh, I match, but there's a k. So let's think, where would that k have come from? Well, I noticed that I did the power rule, but I really have a chain rule. So if I was going to take the derivative, I would have multiplied then by negative 2. And where does that come from? That comes from right here. So I would have taken the derivative of the inside using the chain rule and multiplied by negative 2. So since I'm not doing the derivative, I'm just going to get rid of that, I am going to do the antiderivative, and so I'm going to do the opposite. So instead of erasing, instead of, excuse me, instead of doing the multiplying by negative 2, I'm going to divide by negative 2. And I remember that is just like multiplying by 1 over negative 2. Clean this up. I get an answer of 1 minus 2x all raised to the fourth over negative 8. So, you can ignore this. What is my answer? Well, they want me to find k. So can I locate k? It looks like that would be k, and that means I would have a 1 here. So my answer is that k equals negative 1 eighth. Now remember, you always have an answer key. If you take the derivative of 1 eighth, so take the derivative with respect to x, 1 8 times 1 minus 2x to the 4th plus c, you should get your original function back. So go ahead and try that and make sure that you do get what we first had behind the integration symbol. Okay, now we're ready to go to the next slide. All right, let's try this practice problem. So this is number 25 on page 325. So similar to my other example, they want us to take the integration of 5e to the negative 2t dt and compare it to what they have, which is ke to the negative 2t plus c, and see if we can determine what k is. So let's go ahead and take that antiderivative. When I see an e, I'm just going to write what I see. So my answer is going to be 5e to the negative 2t. Now, if I was doing the derivative, I would have multiplied by, let me just get rid of that, I would have multiplied by negative 2. 
I'm not doing the derivative, I'm doing the antiderivative, so instead I'm going to divide by negative 2. Then don't forget the constant of integration. All right, let's compare our answer to what they have. Okay, these guys match. Uh, let's see, it looks like this matches with this, so therefore our k will be negative 5 halves. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to you. Okay, we're going to do another one of these example problems. I'm going to do it on the next slide. All right, so here's problem number 27. So if we take the integration of 2e to the 4x minus 1 dx, let's see what we get for our answer. So I'll do mine in blue. So I'm getting, write down what I see because I have an e, 2e to the 4x minus 1, then divide by the derivative of the exponent. The derivative of the exponent would be 4, divide by 4, and then don't forget your constant of integration. Then compare your answers. So it looks to me like these line up. That's fine. Okay, this is good. That matches this. So then what's our k? Here's our k. Our k is 2 fourths, which I can reduce to 1 half. So k equals 1 half. Okay, let's do the next one now. Problem 29 does not have an e in it. So let's go ahead and we're going to take the integration of the term behind the integration symbol. So looking at that, I'm going to do the power rule. So in the power rule, I'm going to write down what's in the parentheses, 5x minus 7. Look at the power. So I have a negative 2, add 1 to that, that becomes a negative 1, and then divide by negative 1. But we're not done, because inside here, I have a 5. So the chain rule would require me to multiply by 5, but the antiderivative of the chain rule tells me to divide by 5. So I'm going to put my 5 down here. And then don't forget the constant of integration. So negative 1 times 5 is just negative 5. So I'm going to consolidate that now so that we can do our comparison. Okay, and then let's do one more thing. Let's take that negative and let's just move it to the numerator. Okay, okay now we're ready to compare. So, um, and, <laughs> and I should, I forgot to put the C in their answer. Okay, now we can compare. So looking at what we have, the C's are good. Okay, even this is good. That's a perfect match. So all that remains is K. And so our K would be negative one-fifth. That's the ones implied. So in this situation, K equals negative one-fifth. All right, so that was a fair number of practice problems. I think we're going to, um, well, let me think now. I think I'm going to do one more practice problem. Let's go ahead and we'll do 35 as well. So next slide will be 35. Okay, so look at 35. So in order to do that, I think I'm going to rewrite it one more time so that I have a good setup. So let's rewrite the initial problem as 3 times 2 plus x to the negative 1 dx. The second you see x to the negative 1, I want you to think of natural log. So let's take that antiderivative. I see that. The 3 comes along for the ride. I have natural log of 2x plus, excuse me, of 2 plus x. So let me erase one little thing. I don't need this divisor anymore. Okay, so let's go back. All right, so I have 3. Then I have natural log of 2 plus x, and then plus the constant of integration. Now, when, they, when you provide an answer with natural log, what the book tends to do, and it's totally fine, is to 
put the absolute value symbol so that you never take the natural log of a negative number. So you may write it like this if you like, or you may keep it in parentheses. That would be fine as well. Okay, the most important thing is that I want you to recognize when you have natural log. So doing the comparison like we've done, what I see is that the only difference is the k, and our k is going to be 3. So that's all set. I have one last problem I want to do, and that is problem 55 on page 326. So let's do that next. Okay, so here's a poor cropping of question number 55 on page 326. But at least we can look at it and be able to read it together. So it says a ball is thrown upward from a height of 256 feet above the ground. So this is what is happening. Here's your axis. Here is your time. Here is your um, H for height, how about? And here is my 256. So you have a ball thrown from this height, and it's going to go up, and then it's going to come back down. So that's your scenario. So it says, it gives you some more information, and then the bottom line is, it tells you that velocity, the velocity with respect to time, is going to equal 96 minus 32t. And they asked me to find in A the position function. So what do you know about the position function? You should remember from way back that velocity is the first derivative. Acceleration is the second derivative. And the original function is the position function. So what they're asking you to do is to take the antiderivative of that with respect to time. So I'm taking the antiderivative with respect to time of that function. So what is that antiderivative? Well, it's a pretty basic one. So the antiderivative, which is the original function, which is the position function, is going to equal 96t minus 32t squared over 2. And then don't forget the constant of integration. So let's reduce the 32 over 2. And I'm going to erase that and make that a 16. So this becomes 16. And that's my possible function. Now, it says find the st and then find the function given the height of the ball at time t. So what else do I know? Do I have to have this constant of integration since I have the problem in front of me. Well, what is the height when time is zero? It looks to me like it's 256. So if you had plugged in a zero here and a zero here, your position would equal 256. So you can actually rewrite your equation for this specific problem. So when you take the antiderivative, you're getting the generic antiderivative for numerous scenarios. We have a precise scenario with sufficient information to be able to avoid having the C by just solving for it. So there's your C. Now it says how long will the ball take to reach the ground? Well, it reaches the ground when the position is zero. So there is going to be a ground over here but that's going to be negative, and that's going to not be relevant to our problem. So let's take a factoring of the position function. So if you say st, when you factor it, and you can do it, you're going to end up getting t minus 8, and I believe it's t plus 2. So, um, Take my word for it, or go back and do it. And actually, I take that back. I have one sign incorrect, and you've probably spotted it. It's this one. So that should be a negative. So here are my two values when the height is zero. Solving, 
I get t equals 8, and then I get t equals 2. Negative 2. No, t equals 2. Yeah, my, hmm, let me think about this. Let me think about this. So I think I had it correct to begin with. So hold on, let me just go back and look at that. Yes, I did. Okay, I end up multiplying everything through by a negative 1, so my last number is actually negative, so I was correct the first time. So this sign is actually a plus, and that is correct because this is negative 2, which doesn't make any sense, this is 8, which makes sense, and that's what I need. So go ahead, try to factor that, and you'll see that this is what you really get. Next question. How high will the ball go? Oh, actually, take that back. Um, how long will it take to reach the ground? Do you see that? Let me ask you this. Couldn't you also now, given that you know it takes 8 seconds, couldn't you find the velocity at that time as well by plugging in to the velocity equation that they gave us? Okay, moving on to question C. How high will the ball go? So what do you do for that? Well, this is your height. That's where your first derivative, and what's your first derivative? Oh, wait, that's actually my velocity, equals 0. So I've got to go back up to this original equation, and I've got to say, where does that equal 0? So I'm going to stop the video, you figure that out, and I'll come back and give you the answer. Okay, in the interest of space and time, we're just going to walk through this. So how high will the ball go? What you should do is set your v equal to 0 and solve. And you will get that time is going to equal 3. So, But that doesn't answer how high it goes. So now you know that it gets to its highest point at 3 seconds. So then take your 3 and plug it into your position function. And when you do that, so I'm going to write it over here, I guess, you're going to find that s of 3 is going to equal 400 feet. So plugging in s of t right here, 3 goes in here, 9 goes in here, you're going to say that at s of 3, we have a height of 400 feet. So you should be able to do that. So the takeaway is that all the things that we learned previously are still in play. And now you can work backwards and forwards. So that should help with your studying of this section, and you should now be able to do the homework that was in the top of the first page of notes.